Okay. All right, so this is the problem we were looking at last time. We have our rectangular drug substrate and we we painted a paste onto it and we wanted that the, the active component of that drug to diffuse into the drug and that would then accumulate uh, that active ingredient. Um, at the same time, we were concerned about the addictive nature of that drug, right? So here's the paste, and then we had component A diffusing into the drug substrate. And we were concerned with the total amount of A that would accumulate in the substrate, right? Because um, this is the, uh, the drug substrate, and by the end of the day, someone is going to uh, ingest it. So we want to limit the amount of A in here. And one of the things we started to do was acknowledge how complicated a question this was. Right on the face of it, it doesn't look complicated. We are just asking, um, what's the time at which we reach a certain amount of A in this, uh, uh, in this pull? And it's complicated because of course, the amount is changing over time. So if you were to plot the concentration as it changes with time and space here, so in terms of space, there's Z. So looking in the Z direction, um, initially, we don't have anything there. Initially, um, there's none of component A in the pull. And then after some time passed, some of A has diffused in, and then after some further time, more A has diffused in. And so it's doing this over time. And of course, if we leave it there for a very long period of time, then it reaches its equilibrium value. And uh, of course, that's when the concentration is going to be too high. So around here, the concentration is going to be too high um, and it will be addictive. And uh, if we take T uh, at, at low values, right near zero, so this is where T is close to zero, then we have none of A in the pull and, and it's not going to do anything. So we are looking for some time in between where, the, um, where we are at some intermediate value. So there exists some optimal time for us to stop this process, right? Let's say it's, it's here, for example. So this is, if you like, a T optimal, T opt. And so we want to find this time. And it's complicated because of all this going on, right? And towards that, I actually want to plot, uh, we'll look at just now how to do this, uh, how to get to this uh, solution. But uh, let's just look at uh, what it looks like to begin with. Um, so this is the solution that, um, that I worked at. I'm just going to reduce the number of curves here. So this is showing us um, initially we have zero A in the drug. So this is the Z axis here, right? So uh, zero is at the surface of the pull and one is, uh, is the end of the pull, uh, right? That's deep into the pull as we can go. And so if you look at this, you've got um, initially you have zero uh, inside of the pull and then you have the equilibrium value um, on right just inside. Uh, so just inside the pull where the paste is in contact with the pull, you've got the equilibrium value. And then what's happening here is uh, after uh, a small time later, uh, component A has diffused into the majority of the pull and sometime after that, it has diffused further and so on and so on. And if you increase the time scale here, and I'm just going to double it up, eventually uh, you are going to saturate that pull, right? So eventually you will reach uh, the maximum concentration at, at all points there. Um, so, so we want to know the intermediate stage, right? And so again, you've got with time, the whole, uh, so there exists a profile in Z, a concentration profile in Z. And as time passes, that, uh, that profile is changing. And that is of course the nature of what we are trying to solve here. We are trying to solve for 
a concentration as a function of both of those. So we had gone ahead and uh, derived an equation that tells us how time and space are related for concentration. And uh, we anticipate that if we solve this equation, then we'll get this uh, relationship, right? So CA as a function of T and Z. So an example of a solution uh, that corresponds to that uh, is of course this one. So we can see uh, concentration is a complicated function of Z and as time changes, uh, that whole profile shifts around. And that's just giving us concentration as a function of Z. That's not as yet the total number of moles in that pull. And so uh, the first thing we should do is just uh, state to ourselves uh, what that is that we are looking for. So if it's the total number of moles in the pull, then uh, we can estimate that, of course, by multiplying the concentration by the volume. So normally, if you have a concentration and if you have a volume, then if you just multiply the two together, uh, that will give you a number of moles. Of course, in our situation, this is not one single concentration. Right? As you look at different um, at different Z positions through uh, this pull, you've got different concentrations. So we can't just go and multiply by a concentration as if it's one thing. So what we need to do, of course, is to look up the concentration at some Z position and then multiply that by um, the, uh, the volume uh, associated with that Z position. And then we need to integrate that uh, over all such volumes. So that's how we can estimate the number of moles of A in the whole pull. We look at uh, sub volumes in the pull and add up all those, uh, uh, all those sub molar uh, quantities. So uh, when you see an integration sign, uh, you basically read that as a, as a kind of summation. So we need to add up uh, across the whole pull. Uh, one thing we can do to simplify, of course, we've said that the cross-sectional area is the same at all points. So cross-sectional with respect to diffusion into the pull. So we, we can just say uh, dV is AC dZ, as we've done many times in the development here. Right, so um, we can say that's equal to AC, sorry, ACDZ. So, so now it's an integral in Z. And then, of course, all this may be changing in time as well, right? We not maybe, we, we know it's changing in time. So, so this is how we can estimate the number of moles of A in the pull at some time T, right? We, we get that number of moles just by integrating out the Z. That's another way that you can look at an integration. You can say we are integrating over uh, Z and, and when you integrate over something, you've, uh, you've gotten rid of that something. You've integrated it out of the expression. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to know um, the total number of people in the classroom, then you add up all the individuals, and then you don't need the concept of the individual anymore. You can say the total number in the classroom is this. So you've added out the, uh, uh, the individuals, and now you have the total of the class. So that's a way to read integrals, right? You integrate out the Z. So... Originally, we had two variables, T and Z. We've integrated out Z. Now we've just got T. So that's the total number of moles in the pull. Um, any questions or comments on that so far? Okay, then what we need now is the solution, right? And we can see that uh, in the original problem statement, we are told that if our conditions are like this, then uh, if our equation is of this form and if our conditions are like this, then this is the solution that applies. And uh, this uh, earth, uh, if you haven't seen this before, this is the so-called error function, 
it doesn't mean that uh, there's an error somewhere. It uh, it's a name that's given uh, just because it's uh, uh, it, it's associated. If you look at the original solution, so the the problem that was being solved, the physics problem that was being solved um, in estimating an error, uh, so that that's why it has that name. But it doesn't mean there's an error or something. It's it's just another mathematical function, in a similar way that the exponential function uh, is a transcendental function. This is another such function. So the error function. Maybe uh, let's just take a second and let's just uh, have a quick look at the error function. And apologies, I didn't make any notes on the error function. So we're just going to. Uh, take a look at, uh, yeah, this is the correct formula for it. So the error function is obtained as um, uh, when you're trying to uh, integrate the, uh, the exponential of the argument squared. So if you've got the exponential raised to the power minus t squared integrating in t, um, then of course you can always integrate this, right? If you uh, If you take your exponential function which is this one, right? And then if you apply minus t squared, then that implies a certain range and, and you're moving in a t squared way. Uh, so that will uh, compress the uh, this in in the horizontal direction and then you uh, and then you just take the area under that. So so I'm just describing numerically how you could view this, right? But anyway, the exponential function is well defined. So we all know about the exponential function. And then if you integrate that and then two over root pi, then that's the error function. So the Gauss error function is the full name. Um, so it is useful to go and look up the Gauss error function. And uh, you can see it's quite useful because it's helped us get to an actual analytical solution to our equation. So this is one of the cases where for uh, this PDE under these boundary conditions, we actually do have um, a solution available, right? Not all PDEs have such nice, um, easy, compact uh, solutions like this. Sometimes you are forced to use numerical methods to solve them, but we are quite lucky here. We've got this uh, solution available. Okay, uh, any questions or comments on that error function? <clears throat> Right, so that's the error function. And then in the problem statement, we are actually given a plot of the error function. So this is not in the context of our problem. This is just for some arbitrary input value x. Uh, the error function at value x uh, is shown here. Um, and then you can imagine that, of course, we can integrate under the error function. So if you pick a starting point, let's say at zero, and then you uh, pick another point, let's say at 0 0.5, then of course there exists an area under the curve here. So you can define the integral of the error function as well. And the integral, if you go from zero up, uh, looks like this. So this is simply the integral of the error function. And of course, the reason this is given to you in a nice graphical way is uh, then you don't have to fiddle about with uh, computing the error function and uh, you know, it's a question whether your calculator has the error function and or, uh, or or and the integral of the error function. So anyway, that's just given to you graphically. Okay, um, so let's see now um, in our problem, can we adapt uh, what we have to this? Um, so first off, we know this is the equation that we have, so that's fine. It seems to fit this part of it. Um, and then here, um, we know that we have none of a in our um, uh, in our pull initially. So uh, C a naught is zero in our case. Um, and uh, it could be any value, uh, but uh, so in our case, it's specifically zero. Uh, so in a way, um, the fact that it's zero doesn't matter. The important thing is that, we do know what CA is at t equals zero. So, so the CA naught part, we can uh, apply a value uh, over there. And then um, we also know a concentration at the surface for all time. So in this case, uh, we were talking specifically about t equals zero. Over here, we are talking um, about any time. So for all time, 
but this time at the specific location on uh, the surface uh, of the pill, um, there's uh, uh, some concentration. And in our case, we are given the equilibrium relationship. So um, we know there's a paste on the surface and that paste has a, a specific concentration. We also know the equilibrium constant. So that's given to us as a number, 0 0.3. And so we can calculate the, uh, this should say surface, uh, so, yeah, surface, uh, the surface of the substrate. So right on the surface, right, uh, the, the pull is in equilibrium with the paste. So if you think about it, um, if this is your, your paste out here, and this is your pull down here, then we know it takes time for A to get into the pull. But, but right on the surface, there's no space. There's no, uh, there's, uh, if I can say, there's no uh, volume uh, to hold up the concentration. So right on the surface, right? Uh, so imagine this is a five millimeter pull. I think it is a five millimeter. Um, now let's take a differentially small uh, space here. Let's say this is uh, maybe five angstroms. So if this is just five angstroms, you can imagine uh, the transfer here in such a small space uh, will be such that we will reach some equilibrium between the paste and the pull. So right against the surface here, we will reach equilibrium, right? Of course, it uh, with such a small space, uh, we can reach equilibrium quickly um, for much greater distances, right? Looking into the part, even the five millimeters we normally think of as small, that is massive. Five millimeters is massive in comparison with an angstrom scale space. So, so this takes time. So this concentration uh, along here, that's not at equilibrium, but right next to the paste, we can assume that at this interface, just inside the pull, we can assume that's at equilibrium. So in other words, we, we know the concentration here. We can simply work out the equilibrium concentration in the pull, and that then defines for us um, the, the substrate just at position Z equals naught. So we can say, yes, we do know this one. We, we know the concentration in the pull at Z equals zero. It's the equilibrium value. Um, any questions or comments on that one? Okay, and then the last one, um, this one seems less useful to us, right? This one is saying that as we go off to infinity, um, we get to the initial value. So, um, and of course, our pull is, is not like infinity, right? Our pull is, is only five millimeters. So if we have such a, a thin space, then this statement doesn't seem to be uh, fitting our situation. But you could also interpret this as a kind of uh, insulation condition in the sense that if you have to look an infinite distance away before you can see uh, the, uh, the initial concentration, then you could state that the gradient uh, DC dCA dz, and I'm going to say this is at z equals L, um, then that gradient, so the gradient on the other side, right? Earlier we talked about at the surface where z equals zero. Now we are talking about the other side, right? So for any instant in time on the other side where z equals L, we are saying now that that's equal to uh, the gradient just on the inside. So um, by just on the inside, we'll call that L minus. Um, yeah, so looking at a point just on the inside. Um, so by on the inside, I'm talking about down here now. Remember, Z equals zero over here, and then Z increases, and then uh, it reaches a value of L here. So the gradient just here is, <coughs> <coughs> sorry about that. 
excuse me. <clears throat> so the, the gradient just inside here is equal to the gradient just at the end point. And so we can interpret this. Um, we can say here all BCA or rather D2CA, D2CA, DZ squared equals zero. And this is specifically at Z position L. Oh, geez. So this is for all time and specifically at Z, Z equals L. Right, so we are saying the gradient is constant at Z equals L, therefore the second derivative is zero. So that's a way to interpret that boundary condition. And, uh, and so we will adopt this. We, um, in our case, we can say, well, the pull is, um, it's not that anything is diffusing out on the other side. So if there's no diffusion out here also, then we can say that uh, we can reach a, a kind of constant gradient here. So that's another boundary condition. <clears throat> so if uh, we have all this, um, then we can apply this solution. So let's plot the solution. So let's look at uh, what such a solution would look like. Um, So I've done that, I seem to have lost my Python. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I've done this uh, Python code to, uh, so there's, uh, we, we're using NumPy and we'll use matplotlib to plot it. We also need the math library now because uh, the error function is not uh, in NumPy. So we'll use the math function and uh, the math function. Um, so, so we want the error function from the math library. And for the error function, uh, the, this, uh, this library doesn't actually work on arrays. Uh, this works on scalars, it seems, right? Um, don't hold me to that. Um, as far as I can tell, um, this only accepts scalar uh, numbers in. Whereas, of course, we want to stick a, a whole series of values in. So we can just create a quick function here. So we can define uh, our own instance of the error function. Um, and in that, we will simply loop through all the values um, that we are trying to evaluate the error function at. And we'll add all those values into an array. So this way, we can just get the error function uh, over an array of values. Okay, and so um, here, uh, here's, we're just looking at the error function. So we're just arbitrarily choosing some Z values uh, between minus two and two. And well, we don't need T actually. So we are just plotting the error function um, for those values. And you can see the plot here. And if you look at uh, what we said earlier, uh, that, that follows the shape of the error function. Right, so we have the error function available to us. Uh, that's what we can say so far. Um, any questions or comments on that? Uh, today, everybody's quiet. What's going on? So here, um, right, I just want to emphasize CA is a function of T and Z. And so the solution we want is going to be um, so, okay, let's copy it after our development. So, let's see, so we've done all this. So this is where we were. So, <clears throat> so we have available this solution. Um, in our case, C A C A naught equals zero. And uh, C A S C A S equals, and there's a concentration in the paste, and we can divide by the equilibrium constant. 
So we have both those defined, and so we can um, we can use the general solution. You get the required time profiles, T comma Z uh, profiles. So we can just solve for C A Z here, right? So we can say C A Z equals, and C A naught is a naught, so we can ignore that. So this is basically one minus. Um, so we can just write this as one more, or mm, yeah, let's do that. So it's just one minus one minus C A over C A S. Um, yeah, actually, it's going to be better to just do it as on this side one minus that, and then times C A S C. Yes. So that's C A as a function of T and Z. So that's the solution that we are looking for. And you can see on the right hand side, uh, Z does occur there and T. So Z and T have simply changed the argument of the error function. So let's see what this looks like. So here, well, you can see I've already done it, but I'm just going to, let's do it again here separately. So we've, uh, let's keep control over these variables here. So you've got Z and T defined. And then we have this error function, um, our own um, array friendly version of the error function here. So we can now say C A equals, um, we'll need to run a loop over different times. So let's say for T I in T. So T I is our current choice of time. It's CAS times this. So we will need to define CAS. And we'll multiply that by one minus the error function. So one minus error function Z over two square root. So Z over two times the square root. So square root is in NumPy. So we can say SQRT. And uh, we've got here, sorry, one second. Uh, so uh, there's the square root here, um, DABT. So DAB times T, and we have to be careful to use the local instance of time, the current uh, choice of time. So we'll say here, TI. Okay, so all this uh, I think is Fine, that should be, we might have a problem one minus this. Um, so let's just try this. So we, we are saying here uh, C A, um, what will we do? Will we append this? Let's just try and do this first. So we can say C A, so C A, that's, so. Not too sure this will work. Let's run that. Okay. So, so you can't use a minus on a list, uh, but you can on a NumPy array. So let's just turn this into a NumPy array. And let's count one, two, three brackets. So we need one, two, three closing brackets. So that's where we close. And still an error list. Okay, so we can't um, just do it like this. So um, we can say C A dot append like that. Okay, one time divide by zero. So 
we don't want to divide by a zero here. So this T, instead of starting it from zero, we can start it from a one. Um, sorry, one second. Let me uh, just ask for that vacuuming to stop. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so let's see now. Uh, so we got rid of the zero, right? And just um, uh, to explain that a bit more, <clears throat> yeah, at zero, you can see we are dividing by zero here. And the error function is defined at infinity, but um, we um, but we might get numerical problems. So we might as well just start at some small uh, value beyond zero. Um, and you can make this um, arbitrarily small, but uh, that's, I think that's good enough. Uh, we, are start, we are looking at the solution one second in the future. We actually know the solution at t equals zero, right? We know uh, the concentration is zero at zero. Um, so that's fine. Uh, we we already know the solution at zero. So in a way, we don't need to recalculate it here. Um, and now just for numerical reasons, we'll avoid the zero and just start at a one there. Um, so let's see. Okay, so no warnings this time. And then we can plot. Uh, so we can say here, plt plot, and we want to plot um, z and ca. In fact, we don't need to do this at all. We can say this uh, this profile. So we can say C A I equals this. So at the ith instant in time, there's a C A uh, profile, and so we can append all that like that. And uh, we we don't actually need this anyway, um, but uh, we'll just plot it here. Okay, so that's the solution. Uh, okay, so my Z, uh, yeah, it's, it's giving me the solution all the way from minus two up to two. And of course, that minus two doesn't exist um, for our pull. Our pull starts with the surface at zero, and then uh, it's one millimeter in. Um, and I'm not setting one millimeter. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll set it just now. Uh, so let's just see what, what this gives us. Okay, and uh, and so we can see the zero solution. So when t equals zero, our concentration is zero there, and then component A diffuses in, and so when we when we reach the end point, uh, we can see that curve. So we've got too high a resolution here. Uh, yeah, the temporal resolution. That's that's the way you talk about the, the time resolution, right? Uh, in space, we just say resolution. And to specify for time, the time resolution, we say the temporal resolution. Uh, let's just drop that 10. So now we've just got 10 lines. So you can see the t equals zero line, and you can see the other lines. And then it seems to stop over here. But that's just because we've constrained ourselves to 10 hours. If we go for more hours, then you can see it, it starts to reach the equilibrium value everywhere throughout that pull. Okay, so that's concentration. Any questions or comments there? So one of the things we can do is say, well, I'm only interested in five millimeters into the pull. My pull only goes to five millimeters. So we can say here five millimeters, and let's see what that looks like. So according to that, we um, after such a long period of time, uh, we get that. So let's let's reduce our temporal resolution. So that's there. Um, I think our diffusion rate is a bit high. Okay, so that's a bit more like it. 
And uh, uh, so uh, obviously we should be using the actual values in the problem. And even your surface concentration, you should be using the paste concentration divided by uh, K equilibrium. But anyway, I'm, I'm just using arbitrary numbers uh, to play around with this. So that's the concentration, um, but that's the full profile. What we really want is the number of moles that are accumulated in the pull. And we already said um, how to get it, right? So that's, uh, we really want the moles in the, in the pull. So we have that formula, but we could say, well, let's do this numerically. So we could try and integrate this uh, with respect to Z. Um, and in fact, that's why the, the second graph is given in the problem. But for, for now, let's stick with the code. Let's do this nicely in a kind of code oriented way. So we can say that pure integral is approximated by this Riemann integral, which is the sum of the concentration at the Z position. So we're going to take the I position in Z and then this Delta Z we approximate as a Z I plus one, oops, Z I plus one minus Z I. Okay, and then we can multiply that by AC. So would you agree this is an approximation uh, to this integral? Uh, obviously it's it's a one-sided approximation. You, you could, there are better ways to approximate it, but let's just do it this way. So my DZ is, is linear. Uh, I mean, uh, is constant. I, I used a, a lin space here. That means all my, uh, Z values, if I were to print this, uh, let's just print it. So you can see here between uh, the first two values, zero and here, uh, that's uh, obviously the, uh, the delta Z there. And then you can see this number is two times that, and this number is three times that and, and so on. So the same delta Z applies at all points here. So I'm just going to extract here a dz equals, and I'll just take the first one, z1 minus z0, okay? So that's my delta z defined. And then um, we, we will we'll do the integration. So we can say the number of moles of A equals the concentration at uh, the position z. So here's where we now need to run a loop so we can say four um, z i in z. Um, we can say the concentration. I, I actually need to be careful here. Um, just want to check something. If I say i like that, and here I need to enumerate it. Right, enumerate. So I assume you're familiar with all this in your. Uh, this is second semester. So in first semester, you've, you've done your Python coding, right? Um, so if I enumerate that, let's just see the, uh, what's being printed. That's being printed. So that and here. I. Okay, so it's the other way around. So it needs to be I and ZI like this, I comma, ZI. Okay. All right, so there's the index I. And we want to say here, um, if I is less than the length of Z. So we want the interior points. We don't want uh, to add up points on the edge, uh, on the outer edge. So we'll say here, um, your number of moles in A equals N A plus, and then it's the concentration C at the Z I position times D Z 
and we should say times AC as well. And I'm just going to take an AC, um, what was it, five, um, two centimeters by two centimeters. So it's 2E minus two times 2E minus two. So that's the area. So that's the cross-sectional area. That's the delta Z. So that's uh, approximately the area. And then that is the number of moles at position Z and Z plus delta Z. So that's how we can add up our moles in A. So we can set, set in, well, we need to do this in the loop. So we can say here, yeah, NA equals zero. And what we want to do is uh, save all these NAs. So we are going to calculate for each instant in time, right? Remember we are running a loop in time and we are recalculating the number of moles in the pull at an instant in time. So we need to uh, accumulate all these in some function. Let's just call it N equals, it's an array like that. So after we add up all the NAs, then we can say N append NA. Let's see any issues, no issues with that. And so we can plot separately. So we can do thing two equals ELT, ELT dot plot. And here we'll say T comma N. Uh, okay, let's try to use the same plot. Um, I think we say, should say here, big two equals PLT dot big. Nope. Sorry, I just need to do a quick Google here. Uh, uh, I just needed to write the full thing bigger like that. Okay. So there we go. We can see the number of moles of A rising with time. Um, one thing we could do to make this better is uh, we should actually say the number of moles, it starts from zero. Um, but uh, I know that's going to, uh, and then uh, instead of T, uh, we, we can append a zero in front of the T. But anyway, uh, we won't do that. Uh, we'll just plot it like this. Okay. So we can see how the moles uh, will increase in the pull with time. And we can also, we can increase the time range. And you can see it's accumulating, but our resolution is a bit low. Um, let's see. So in Z, we are only using 50 points. In T also, let's do that. So we can smooth it out like that. So you can see um, this pull doesn't seem to reach that, uh, what is the safety limit? Um, the safety limit to avoid addiction, 0 0.5 moles. And here we don't seem to be going near that. Well, I didn't use the correct numbers. Uh, so I know the concentration in the paste is actually much higher. Uh, so, um, so anyway, this is how you calculate the total number of moles in the pull. And then you would just look to see, am I, let's say 1.6 times 10 to the minus six, maybe that was your concern. So you were concerned about uh, an addictive concentration here. So then you would look across here and then you would go down and you would say, okay, that, that happens at 50. So after 50 seconds, I need to wash off the paste because once I've washed off the paste, um, component A will not uh, be diffusing into the particle anymore. So I basically stopped it there. Okay, so that's a fine example of, a, um, of an application of 
all this development that we've been doing. So we derive the equations, um, we propose our boundary conditions, and then we look for a solution that corresponds to those boundary conditions. And once you have that solution, you can start doing practical engineering with it. In our case, we used this to estimate the total number of moles in our space. And you can imagine there are many, many such things. So uh, for example, in a reactor where you've got uh, hundreds of thousands of particles bang banging around, uh, you'd, you would typically add up over all the particles and estimate the total reaction rate. So that's a fine example of um, how we go from the very small scale to the very large scale. So in our real reactor, for example, you may have, right? So this reactor is on the order of cubic meters, whereas our particles, right? Sometimes our particles are on the order of microns, right? Um, so uh, it's really dust sometimes. And, uh, and actually in those particles, there is a lot of action going on. There are concentration gradients and that changes the reaction rate and all of that. So it's complicated, right? It's, uh, well, not complicated, it's tedious. We don't want as engineers to be thinking about at every angstrom position what, uh, uh, what our concentration is. Um, and so we have means of going from the very small scale to the much larger scale and so, uh, so then we can start to answer practical engineering questions like, uh, how long must I leave the paste on this uh, drug substrate? So that's uh, an approach if you were to go the coding route. Um, if you want to go the graphical route, um, the integral is available here. So the integral of the error function is available here. So what we could do instead is, here, where we want the integral, and uh, remember this integral, uh, that's the integral with respect to z. So we can say the lower limit here is zero, and the upper limit is at uh, five millimeters. So this is five millimeters. Uh, no, what's the thickness? Two, yeah, no, five millimeters. So the upper limit is um, 0 0.5. Five. Okay, I've messed up this integral. <clears throat> but up here, it's 0 0.5 millimeters. So 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus three. And so we would then, um, we would take that as our upper limit in our plot, um, in our plot here. And so we work out for 0 0.5 millimeters what the value of the argument is. In our case, our argument, well, um, our error function argument, well, it's the integral. So you work out for that five millimeters what the argument x is, and let's say it's here. Then you look at the value here and subtract it from the value there. Uh, that is zero, so it's just the value here. And then that will give you the number of moles. So that's how you can use the graphical approach there. Okay, uh, I guess that's it for today. And as I mentioned um, by email uh, or in the announcement, we will be using all the slots next week. So um, we will cover the, the next part of analogies with other types of balances, and uh, that will all be leading us towards the test. So we'll talk about all that next week. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, see you next time.